Right, so uh, yeah, thank you for joining everybody. This is the agenda for today. So I'm going to introduce you as to who we have on the call with us today. Um, so from Innovate, um, it'll be myself. And obviously from Bayes, I believe we've got, is it Alex and Charlotte? Yeah, uh, and I've got Joe Lyford as well from Innovate also. And obviously we have everybody here. Um, so. We'll take you through uh, the scope in just a second, um, uh, as well as the process sections. And at the end of both of those sections, there's a Q&A section where you'll be able to have the opportunity to ask any questions related to the scope or process. So please feel free to type questions into the Q&A box as we go through the briefing. Okay, uh, so yeah, just quick welcome and introductions. My name is Stephanie Armitage. I work here at Innovate. Um, and obviously we've got Zoe here as well, who's head of competitions at APC. So hello, Zoe. Um, so I'll just hand over to you, if that's all right, to go ahead and get started on the scope section. Thanks, Steph. Um, so good morning. As I say, Zoe Hall here from the head of competitions and projects at the APC. If you could just move on to the next slide for me, please. Um, so what we'll do is we'll start off with an overview of the application process. Uh, the scope for APC 23 has intentionally stayed largely unchanged from APC 22. So therefore, we are still looking for collaborative R&D projects that both design and develop and manufacture technology that works towards delivering that net zero on vehicle technology for on and off road vehicles. So uh, just to give you an overview, uh, question one is a mandatory question on, on where the uh, project is occurring. Um, and then the rest of the project is split, uh, the application is then split into three parts. So part one looks at the business case and the benefits of the proposed project and is covered by questions two to five. You then have part two, which addresses the, the technical innovation the project management and the risks, which are covered by questions six to eight. And these questions are all assessed by an independent technical panel. We then move on to question three, uh, sorry, part three, which covers questions nine and 11 and focuses on the funding and added value. Uh, question nine is also where you download the value for money Excel workbook. And then question 10 and looks at the additionality and 11, the funding model. And then part four, questions 12 to six, uh, 14, allows us the opportunity to provide supplementary evidence to the workbook. Alex Grant uh, will touch on this further uh, shortly. And part three and part four are covered by uh, and assessed by the Bayes appraisers and the economists. Uh, they will also consider your answers to the technical questions. So questions two through to eight, to determine the benefits of the projects from a value for money perspective. And likewise, the technical panel will also consider your responses to question uh, nine to 14. It's important to flag this as when, is you, uh, when and if you get through to phase two of the assessment process, you may get asked questions that are quite similar in outlook, but actually require different responses when you look at it through a technical and an economic lens. But the APC are here to, to support you with those responses. And then lastly, you've got question 15, which is a marketing contact. And this is important so that APC and the Bayes um, Marcoms team can contact the right person should you be successful. And Evie will touch on that later. Um, Please be aware that you, are, you can submit a previously submitted application once, but that you can't submit it more than that without a material change. If you do have any questions around that, do contact us at the APC. So moving on to the timeline slide, if you can for me, Steph. Um, hopefully you are aware of these um, uh, dates that you've got in front of you, but I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of things. So first of all, uh, for those of you that are not so familiar with the APC CR&D competitions, they are a two-stage process. So that means that you have that initial um, application deadline, which we'll go through in detail today, but then you also have a second stage um, should you reach the quality threshold for the first. 
So firstly, the application deadline is 11 o'clock on the 15th of March. Uh, there are no exceptions, so please make sure that if you are leading this project, you have all partners, all collaborators, making sure that they are working well in advance of that deadline. One of the things that people do tend to get tripped up on is the T's and C's box. So do make sure that all participants have ticked that T's and C's box ahead of submitting for that 11 o'clock deadline. Otherwise, you will fail to submit and there is absolutely nothing, unfortunately, that we can do about that. And then moving on to the, the second stage, um, it is really important that you, that you put enough resource around this. Um, it's as critical as the first stage, and although perhaps not quite as labour intensive, there is an awful lot to get through in a fairly short amount of time. So you'll be notified on the 14th of April, um, should you have a high enough technical score to proceed to the next stage. You'll then have till the 28th of April to respond to a substantial set of questions raised by the base appraiser team, which Alex will go through shortly. In addition, you may also have a telephone consult around these responses, which will take place on Monday the 8th of May. The next deadline you need to focus on is the 10th of May, when you will provide a response to questions raised by the technical assessors. And then you'll need to switch gear and focus on the presentation, which is due for the 15th. Um, what you need to be aware of is that um, you can't change the presentation once it's submitted. So you do need to put the right content in there, uh, but make sure that you don't put too much content so that you can verbalise things as you practice that as we meet the deadline for the interview panel. The interview panel dates you'll be notified of. Again, these applied through Innovate UK and are unlikely to be changed. So as lead um, um, person, you are responsible for making sure that those nine people that you nominate to take through to that interview panel can make the, day, the, the date that you're given. Um, can we move on to the next slide for me as well, please? So now let's go through a little bit more scope, a little more, more detail to help you put through that perfect application. So what we're looking for for APC 23 Industrialising Net Zero Automotive Technology Competition um, is these the key scope requirements on the next couple of slides. So we have uh, 20 million pounds of match funding to provide this um, on this competition scope. And we're particularly looking for collaborative pre-production projects that are that late stage um, and that help accelerate the UK towards net zero, but they must have an automotive focus. So these projects can develop um, on vehicle technologies for material, product or manufacturing processes. And we're particularly interested, and it is a focus of the competition scope around that supply chain associated with this. So, the project must be UK based, as I say, it must be collaborative, um, has to be late stage um, and it is match funded. It must make sure that you support the UK's capability through ensuring that there is long term R&D investment in the UK as a result of this project and it, it must support the associated supply chains. Um, as previously touched on, it is an automotive focus first and foremost, but obviously if there are cross-sectorial uh, utilisation of the project outcomes, this is beneficial. Um, and also, you know, we need to make sure that we've got that UK capability grown with, as a result of these projects. So that UK upskilling and knowledge transfer is really important. If we move on to the next slide, please, for me, Steph. Um, Probably are very aware that the APC platform is supported by the Auto Council and as such the project's um, scope must align with the technologies that you can see on the left hand side of this screen. Um, it is note, uh, it's, it's important to note actually on the, on the thermal propulsion systems. Um, we are and specifically looking at sort of the hydrogen ice aspect of that, that we're looking for fossil fuel free at the point of use of that internal combustion. And the case of uh, on-road solutions, we will only support projects that aim to achieve zero, zero harmful uh, tailpipe emissions. Um, if you want any further clarification on that, please do contact the APC. In terms of other requirements, um, eligible costs can be variable. 
but the grant drawdown must be between 2.5 and 20 million pounds. It is match funded, as I say, so a maximum intervention rate on this competition will be 50%. But obviously, if you can be um, demonstrate better value for money, that will be hugely beneficial. I'm sure Alex will touch on that later. Project duration is between 18 to 42 months. You must have either a um, vehicle manufacturer or a, a, a tier one supplier to clearly demonstrate that route to market at the end of the project. And you must also contain an FME. As a rough guide, we, um, we suggest a minimum, uh, sorry, a maximum of six participants. That's just purely from experience and managing larger co uh, collaborations can be tricky, but that is up to your discretion. So let's go through the questions. If you can move on to the next slides for me, please, Steph. So as mentioned earlier, uh, question one simply asks the location where the work has been carried out. So I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, question two is around the business case. And we've put this uh, front and center in the line of questioning. So we were looking for a strong description of the business case, which should be explained in sufficient detail to understand the justification for undertaking the project and how the project links with your overall organizational strategy across all partners. We need to understand the benefits from the consortium, so it's not just purely from the lead itself. These must be clear and then in order to be able to justify the collaborative approach and why it is beneficial for this project to be taken as such. A useful bit of advice here is, to, is that you probably outline this question in the first instance, but complete this question last. Um, you need to make sure that all the collaboration partners uh, have, have a voice. Um, and quite often that becomes quite last minute. And this is really the opportunity to outlay what the project looks like. So make sure that once you've completed that, um, at, at the application its entirety, you go back and review this qu response question and make sure that it covers all the salient points and it all ties together. If we move on to the next question, please. Um, so question three, here we're looking for a well-researched and understood market description and how this project bridges the gaps. Ideally, this should be backed up with a lot of customer evidence and interest. It's important that you acknowledge any barriers, including the influence of competitors, and have mitigations in place to combat this. Typically, this question is answered pretty poorly, um, and predominantly because it lacks evidence. So it's a good thing to do at this question is to reference perhaps the APC and the Auto Council roadmaps and the gaps that your project is going to bridge when you successfully complete it. Uh, on to question four then for me, Steph. Um, so the next couple of questions here relate to benefits. Um, so what we've done here is we've separated out the consortia and the external, external benefits to the supply chain. So question four is looking for the significant supply chain benefit and your strategy within this. So this is where evidence is crucial and you will get higher marks when you can evidence how this project will impact the anchoring growth or significantly improve the productivity and competitiveness of the UK automotive supply chain. So it's a good idea here to be able to clearly um, target suppliers and customers. If you pass the initial assessment process um, and get to the second, then interview, your project needs to score in excess of 60% on this question uh, to be allowed to fund it. Uh, from an appendix point of view here, I suggest you put a supply chain um, or a value stream map, and then you can cover things like your potential suppliers, uh, gaps in the current supply chain, um, include companies and locations if you do have them, um, and evidence the work uh, done if you've done it on supply chain risk and uh, management. We recognise that our assumptions, but the more evidence and the more information that you can put into this is helpful. And if you do have letters of support outside the collaboration, it's a really good place to include them in the appendix here. If we move on to question five, so this question has a, a slightly change in focus and it looks at the perspective um, of the consortia. So what are the benefits to the consortia itself? And we're looking for justification for this approach, how the consortia will unlock technical and commercial opportunities beyond the core aims of the project and a clear dissemination plan and next steps in terms of R&D. 
as I say, the main focus is automotive, but if you can demonstrate here how uh, cross-sectorial mobility for the technology that you're going to develop or the processes you're going to develop, this will be attractive. You need to provide a substantial amount of data and evidence in this question. So keep your answers brief and use your appendices well. Okay, next question then, please. Next slide, Steph. So um, here we're now going into the, into the bulk of the technical assessment. Um, so we hope here to get detailed answers um, around this particular question with credible discussion, not just on what you will do, but the logic and the steps that you're going to do to be able to actually achieve it. So we're looking for a high level of innovation in this program with organisations either generating their own IP or exploiting um, IP in a different way. You need to convince the assessors that, you are, what, that what you are proposing is sensible and deliverable. Um, and just be aware that you keep the, the project manage, management element out of this, out of this question that is covered in question seven, which I'll go on to now. So here um, on question seven, if we move on Steph, we are, we're looking for your ability to, to deliver and exploit, and exploit is critical here, a successful project. So we need to have an evidence of either an internal or a, an external uh, project management methodology, um, a sensible work, uh, work package breakdown structure that's really well laid out and um, easily communicated. There needs to be that clear project plan that demonstrates that you have considered the technical deliverables from start to the end of the project and have clear line of sight for, uh, for start of production. We're looking for evidence of buy-in from sponsors uh, in the partner organisations. And rather than painting a rosy picture, tell us how you're going to deal with things that go wrong. You know, things that disagreements, escalations within the school, uh, consortia, how, how, do, how are you proposing to mitigate those? You need to include a Gantt chart at this um, for the appendices here. And that needs to be a Gantt chart of your project plan that is readable at 100% Zoom. So you need to have clearly laid out milestones, you need clear interdependencies uh, so that the technical panel can actually work through the project plan and ask you salient questions um, for your deliverable of a successful project. So if we just move now on to, to question eight. Um, so this is the last question of uh, part two. Um, it sits alongside the, the previous questions are, um, and, and it is all around focusing on the risks, both within the project life cycle and beyond. So you need to consider risks to, for successful exploitation and commercialization. You should provide a well laid out risk, risk register with suitable mitigations and a budget assigned where applicable. This question, again, is quite poorly answered. It tends to be one of the questions that's left to the end. It tends to be quite lead centric and not consortia answered, and it tends to be quite generic on risks. So really consider this question well um, and make sure that your risk register is in sufficient detail that, um, that you can demonstrate to the technical panel that you have considered every eventuality and that it is collaborative because if it's lead centric, it does clearly demonstrate that, as a, that you are not going to be able to deliver the collaboration well. So that very quickly is myself and the questions through one, two, eight. Um, myself and colleague uh, Dan Bunting will um, be on the line for questions later. And now I'm going to hand over to Alex from Bayes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm Alex Grant from Bayes, uh, and I work in the auto analysis team, uh, and I work on the value for money assessments um, for your projects. So next slide, please, Steph. So I'm just going to present a bit about what is value for money and why do we assess it in government. Um, talk through what evidence and information we're looking for from you to conduct a robust value for money assessment uh, and then a few tips on how to fill out the value for money workbook. Uh, next slide please. So in government we need to ensure that all public spending uh, is good value for the taxpayers which is why we'll conduct a value for money assessment um, on all public funding for R&D projects that meet and ensure need to ensure they meet a minimum fresh threshold 
Um, this threshold is based on the benefit cost ratio. Next slide, please. And the benefit cost ratio is simply the monetized benefits to the UK economy uh, divided by the cost to the government. In this case, the cost is simple. It's just the grant funding that you're requesting. Uh, and obviously, the lower the ask of the government, the higher the benefit cost ratio will be. Uh, the benefits we account for, we account for employment benefits. So uh, how and how many and what type of jobs are created and safeguarded by your project. Um, how your technology contributes to reduced emissions in the auto sector uh, and our R&D spillovers. So to what extent is knowledge acquired in your project shared with the wider auto and manufacturing sectors. We also adjust these benefits by risk and additionality, which is the extent to which the project is reliant on government funding. Um, and I'll talk a bit about a bit more about these in a few slides time. Next slide, please. So now on to um, a more detailed description of the information and evidence that we need from you. Uh, next slide. So we're going to get uh, a number of documents that we can use for our assessment. Uh, first of all, the written application, which uh, Zoe's just gone through the previous questions for. Uh, this is where we'll get a general understanding um, of the benefits to the UK of your project and why funded is needed. Uh, and this is a particularly important for our assessment of additionality and risk, since these are more qualitative um, assessments and we can't use any re really any data to make this judgment. Um, and then we'll get your value for money submission, which is where you'll input figures on jobs saved, um, on expenditure and on carbon savings. But it's crucial that the uh, figures in here are consistent with the narrative uh, and well evidenced. And then there's the appendices as well, which is your chance to further justify your claims. Um, so for example, you might want to provide a calculation of how sales figures have been reached uh, and how post-project manufacturing jobs link to post-project expenditure. Um, but I would just add that please be careful in this section because it's a PDF and there's lots of information on each slide. Please be careful that all diagrams um, are well are legible and easy to read for us. So once we've evaluated these three um, documents, we'll then come back to you with a series of questions and clarifications to fill in any gaps that we might have found. Uh, and we may ask for a video call um, after we've received the answers to these, but this is not guaranteed. So please don't be alarmed if we don't feel the need um, for a further call. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, it's important that there's a logical narrative in your application, details of calculation methods, uh, and the evidence in the VFM form and written application match. Uh, and you can provide evidence in all kinds of forms, diagrams, tables, spreadsheets. Um, but really, the more evidence, the better. If there's a lack of evidence, we'll, we'll assume the worst and, and score low on things like additionality and risk. Next slide, please. So now I'll talk in detail about what we are looking for to be able to calculate the project's benefits. Um, so first of all, R&D spillovers. Why do we care about this? Well, it's not only your project that will benefit from the technologies. Hopefully, there'll be wider spillovers into auto and other manufacturing uh, uses. So in the written, written application, we're looking for how and, and what you'll register in terms of intellectual property for the technology uh, and how this is going to be disseminated up and down the supply chain and, and maybe what cross-sectoral uses it will have. We also want to know um, how knowledge will be shared within the court consortium uh, and the nature of the co collaboration that's going to take place. So for this, because it's more qualitative, uh, the bulk of the evidence will be in the written application, uh, but we'll also look for post-project expenditure in the VFM workbook and also the impacts of the project on TRL and MRL. Um, 
employment. We care about this is obviously good for society, but uh, furthermore, a lot of these projects take place in key areas for leveling up where the wage is going to be significantly higher than the uh, region's median wage. So we want to know um, what are the jobs, how many jobs are safeguarded and created in the R&D phase and manufacturing phase of the projects. Um, and we need, in the written application, it needs to be clear why these jobs would not exist in the absence of APC funding uh, and evidence of job figures being proportional to the project expenditure. Uh, in the VFM workbook, you'll provide the number of jobs, um, job title, salary, postcode. Um, but it's important that you only include R&D and manufacturing jobs um, and not other indirect jobs such as administrative roles. I'd say this is the area of the application where we most commonly have to come back to the applicant with clarifications. So um, one thing I've seen is RNG jobs extending well beyond the R&D phase and likewise manufacturing jobs beginning before manufacturing starts in the project. Um, this can in theory be possible, but we, we, work, we don't expect to see it. So we need a lot of evidence um, explaining why this is the case, if, if this happens to be the case. Um, similarly, I've seen an applicant say that all of their company's jobs would be lost in the if APC funding wasn't successful. Again, in theory, this could happen, but we think it's unlikely that um, a company is solely reliant on APC funding for its future. So we'd need to see really strong evidence for this. So jobs figures should be FTE totals for each year um, and not new jobs created each year. So for example, if you had 20 jobs created in year one, uh, and a further five created in year two, you'd input 25 into the column for the second year, not five, assuming none of the 20 initial jobs were lost. So we also care about carbon savings because this is a big objective of, of the APC to reduce carbon um, produced by the auto sector. Uh, and the way we calculate this is how your technology reduces CO2 emissions for the next generation of vehicles um, using a comparative vehicle. Uh, so if the comparative vehicle is petrol or diesel, we'll estimate the tailpipe emissions reduced um, because of your technology, but the comparative vehicle can be electric and we can estimate the grid emissions saved as well. And the comparative vehicle should be the best, next best alternative for consumers in the absence of your project being completed. Uh, so this means that it, it can change over time, especially with regulations that come in in 2030, for example, we'd expect passenger vehicles to move from petrol and vehicle comparators towards electric comparators as time goes on. Um, next slide, please. So now on to the two uh, weightings that we make. First of all, additionality. Um, this is an estimate of what proportion of the benefits occur because of the government uh, spending intervention in your project. So we're looking on, look, we're looking for evidence of why your project needs APC funding to go ahead and why that particular amount. Uh, so you might want to provide evidence of um, an inability to raise sufficient funds or meet internal rate of return without uh, government support or you may want to show that your company has um, a alternative location abroad that is um, a lower cost alternative without the support from the government in the UK. And we also want to see what would happen if you don't win APC funding. So will the project go ahead but at a smaller scale or will the project be delayed unless you'll lose your competitive advantage in the market? And just to reiterate, this is a qualitative measure, measure. So really the more evidence that you can provide, the better. Next slide, please. Um, we also evaluate the project risks. Um, I won't talk too much about this because Zoe's already gone through it, but it is equally as important for additional, as additionality, sorry. Uh, we know that R&D projects are inherently risky. So we're looking uh, to, to have a level of confidence that all risks have been considered and accounted for. So we'll mainly look at the risk register for this. Um, next slide, please. So now I'll just 
give a few uh, tips briefly on how to fill out the VFM workbook. Next. So the link to the workbook will be in question nine. Um, and this will also be where the upload, upload point is when you've completed the worksheet. Next slide. So in the workbook itself, you should only input figures into the gray cells um, and select options from the orange drop down menus. Please don't submit uh, input anything into the yellow cells because these are internal calculations to the spreadsheet, so shouldn't be touched. Um, and please be aware that not all sheets ask for data in the same way. So as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the jobs figures need to be totals or kind of cumulative, whereas for expenditure, it should be only the amount that's spent in each year. But there's loads of guidance of this on the sheets, just be sure, sure to uh, read it carefully. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, next. So finally, there is a sheet in the workbook on the wider environmental benefits of the pro proposed project. Now, we don't include this in the BCR calculation, um, but it, it's really valuable information for us going forward. We like to know things like what material uh, you're using, um, how much energy is used in production and, and manufacturing, um, the efficiency of logistics up and down the supply chain, and general life cycle environmental costs or benefits of the project. Um, and the reason for this is we know that going forward, it's going to be less common for us to be comparing the technology against something that produces tailpipe emissions uh, and to a situation where the comparative vehicles are other low emission technologies. Uh, and in this case, it's a lot harder to quantify the environmental benefits. Um, so because of that, we want to know what you have the most data on and what's most important to you from an environmental point of view so that we can incorporate this this into our value for money assessment in the future. So that's just about as specific as I can be at the moment because we don't know exactly what evidence we're looking for, but that's what we're hoping to learn from you. Uh, and so it goes without saying, the more detailed you can be, the better. Next slide, please. Uh, so that's that's it from me. Thank you for listening. And hopefully I'll have a chance to answer questions um, at the end of the session. And if not, you can feel free to get in contact with me by email, which is up on the screen. Uh, thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alex. So just quickly moving on to the eligibility uh, section of the webinar. OK, so um, please be aware that addressing assessor feedback does not necessarily guarantee that the application will be funded, uh, but this Obviously, this competition does allow for previously submitted applications. And as you can see here, there's an example of a previously submitted application and a not previously submitted application. OK. OK, so types of organisations that we fund. Um, so these are the types of organisations that Innovate UK funds. So in applying to this competition, the lead partner needs to be a UK registered business of any size. Um, then we have research organisations, so either a university or one of these other categories. And then we have public sector organisations and charities also. So uh, on January 1st, 2021, the UK left the EU and is no longer subject to EU laws on state aid. So on this slide, you can see a link to the guidance issued by Bayes. Um, so if you are unsure of whether you are eligible to receive a subsidy, please seek legal advice. Uh, further information is available on our website and you can also contact our customer support services team if you have any questions. So um, a going concern is, uh, is a business that is assumed that will meet its financial obligations when they fall due. So it functions without the threat of liquidation or foreseeable future. <clears throat> so you should make sure that your organisation is eligible before you submit an application. And if you are unsure of whether you are eligible to receive subsidy control, please seek further independent legal advice and further information again is available on our website or you can also contact 
our support team if you have any questions. Um, so if you're an applicant that's conducting activities that will affect trade of goods and or electricity between Northern Ireland and the EU, uh, as envisaged by Article 10 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, then you must apply under European Commission state aid rules. So in order to be eligible to receive state aid, you must pass the undertakings in difficulty test. So this only applies to limited liability companies that are more than three years old. And if you have a parent company, the test can be performed on your parent or holding company. And if you are successful in the competition, we will apply this test as part of our viability checks. And if you are unsure as to whether or not you are eligible to receive state aid, again, please seek legal advice. And again, further information is available on our website and with our customer support team. So this kind of just goes into detail in terms of the funding opportunities for this competition. So obviously industrial research projects, uh, your costs of 70% if you're a micro or small organization, 60% medium sized, 50% if you're a large organization. And then for experimental development projects, um, which are obviously nearer to market, uh, you can get up to 45% if you're a micro or small organization, 35% if you're a medium size, and up to 25% if you're a large organization. So for research organizations conducting fundamental research, you could get your funding for your eligible project costs up to 100%. <clears throat> so participation rules, uh, please remember that at least 70% of total eligible project costs must be incurred by a business. If you have an academic or RTO in your consortium, the maximum level of project cost is 30%. And if there is more than one, they would share the 30% between them. And research organizations are not able to lead in this competition, but may partner in many in as many applications sorry, as they wish and more detail will be covered later in the slide deck uh, so what is collaboration so there must be evidence of a genuine collaboration you'll need to explain in your application how all parties will contribute to the project and benefit from the collaboration also And if you have another uh, outstanding final claim or independent accountant report or a live Innovate UK project, you will not be eligible to apply in this competition as a lead or a partner organisation. So again, we will not award you any further funding if you've previously applied to a competition uh, as the lead or sole company and were awarded funding by Innovate UK um, and did not make substantial effort to exploit that award. And then again, applied in a previous competition as the lead or sole company and fail to comply with the grant terms and conditions. Steph, can I just interject there as well? Uh, yeah. Another condition of the APC funding is that you also can't have any outstanding uh, levy payments to the APC. So if that is the case, um, we will not be able to put you forward to, to assessment as well. So please ensure that that's not the case. Or if you do have any further um, requirements on that, just contact either myself or Dan and we can talk you through that. Fantastic. Um, so these are just some key dates to bear in mind for this competition. So it's important to note that the submission deadline is at noon, um, well, 11 a.m., sorry, on the dot. Um, so IFS will automatically close. So at 11.01, applications will not be able to be submitted. We strongly recommend that you submit your application as early as possible, as traffic will be high on the deadline day. So please contact customer support in advance of the deadline if you experience any difficulties with submitting your application so we can assist you in good time. So just moving on to uh, the IFS system itself uh, and how to use it and how to apply. So uh, to apply for a competition, the lead applicant will need to create an account. So if you've applied for previous competitions on IFS, you can simply sign in. Uh, if you've forgotten your password, please click the need help signing in or creating an account drop down and this will bring up a forgotten your password link. So you can use Companies House Lookup to search for your organisation uh, to save, typing in the name and address. Um, if you are not on Companies House, you can manually enter all of your information. And we advise that research organisations and academics or unis manually enter your information so that you're not listed as a business on IFS to ensure that you receive the correct funding amounts. 
So uh, project details. So this is just a brief overview. So application details, um, you know, please make sure that your research category is correct as this is used to calculate your grant value. The lead applicant completes this section. Uh, subsidy basis, just the third one down here. Please list where your partners and projects are based. This is not applicable for any academic partners, but all other partners in your consortium will need to answer this question. Um, so project summary, highlight the need or challenge, um, approach and innovation and the outcomes. Key to setting the scene for assessors as it gives them an overview of your vision. Uh, public description, uh, publish if your project is successful. So please be aware of confidentiality here. And then scope. It is important that your project is within scope to receive funding. Please use this field to justify how your project fits the scope for assessors. If you're unsure as to whether or not your application is in scope for this competition, please do again contact customer support. So just moving on to the application finances section. <clears throat> So in order to claim funding, your business does not have to be UK registered with Companies House when you apply, but it must be registered before you can receive funding. So you are unable to claim funding if you're an overseas organisation, so your company number begins with FC. Your organisation is set up as a branch, so your company number begins with BR. You are a collaboration with no formal structure or of ownership or control, so your company number begins with ML or if you're a Crown Dependency, so based in Jersey and your company number begins with JE. If your company is based in Guernsey and if your company is based in the Isle of Man. And then this is just a list of overseas territories. So you're also unable to claim funding if your company is based in any one of these as well. So uh, project costs. Uh, Obviously, we've got labour, overheads, materials, equipment usage, subcontractors, travel and subsistence, and then the other section. So labour costs uh, enter the role within the project, gross annual salary, the number of staff and the days to be spent on the project. It will then automatically calculate the total costs. If you have multiple people in the same role on the same average salary, enter this in, in the role within project field. So if an employee is part time, you should enter their costs as full time equivalent and you can adjust the working days per year from the default if this is different for your project. So please note that dividends, bonuses and non-productive time cannot be included within your labour costs as they are ineligible. So when making grant claims against labour costs, actual cost claims must be supported with timesheets. So uh, enter and describe what materials you intend to use in the project, the volume and the cost. The materials listed must be project specific. So please provide as much information as possible. For example, uh, just putting consumables 50,000 does not provide enough detail and you will be required to provide more information from the project finance team if you are successful. So any items which you would usually reciprocate as per your company policy should be listed in capital usage. Materials supplied by associated companies or subcontracted from other consortium members, these must be listed at cost, excluding any profit element or margin. So subcontractors, if this cost is going to be significant, then you will need to justify who, why and what you need them for, both here and in your application. It's important that you justify the use of subcontractors within your application, especially those that are non-UK based, as the assessors do not see this level of financial detail, they will only see the total cost. So if you use a parent or a sister company, please ensure that you list at cost and do not include profit. Uh, so here you will include such things as essential meetings that you have that will happen during the project. You cannot include any sales and marketing activity as this is ineligible. Travel costs must be economy travel only and you should be prepared to provide a breakdown of these costs if the project finance reviewer asks for more detail. So, for example, they might require you to split a trip up into its substance. So uh, overheads, we define overheads as additional costs and operational expenses incurred directly as a result of the project. So these could include additional costs for administrative staff, 
general IT, rent and utilities, and you can select from the three options and you can see on screen how you would like your overheads calculated. So we class indirect, uh, so for example, administration overheads as those costs associated with back office functions such as finance or HR, whose primary function is to support the running of the business. Um, so they can only claim a portion of their time and their work needs to be additional to the delivery of the project. So typically these costs are not directly related to, you know, particular product or service production. Um, and direct overhead costs are associated with staff working directly on the project. So for example, laptops, laptops, sorry, desks, office facilities, and we supply a simple form into which you can list each type of direct overhead together with methodology or basis um, according to this particular project. Again, these overheads would not be incurred if the project does not happen. So here you'll need to describe how you're using the equipment, whether it is new or existing, the new purchase cost, how long you are depreciating, depreciating sorry, it's over, and the residual value at the end. And these calculations will need to be in line with your accounting practices. And then here's just a list of other, so costs supported and costs not supported. Uh, so funding rules, as previously mentioned, the level of funding awarded will depend upon the type of organisation and the type of research being undertaken in the project. And IFS will calculate your grant based on your answers that you have input. So as a reminder, the amount of funding you are eligible to receive is dependent upon your organisation type. So just moving on to academic partners. So academic partners in your consortium will need to complete a JES form, uh, which they sh should be familiar with. Uh, the form validates costs for us. Innovate UK don't have access to the JES system to extract information ourselves, which is why we need this information to be sent to us. So when they've completed their JES form, academics will need to include their unique reference number on IFS and input their figures. So please ensure that the figures you provide are identical. Uh, form must be with council status and uh, uploaded to IFS as a PDF. And then if you have any queries, uh, all of the JES information is on this slide. So submitting your application. Uh, for collaborative applications, IFS will highlight to the lead applicant any partners who have any outstanding project finances to complete. All finances must be included in the application before the lead applicant can submit. And it will also check that your research participation costs are within the required limits. So IFS does not validate project costs. It is your responsibility to ensure all costs are within the eligible total project costs as stated within the, the guidance. So uh, if you find the need to edit your application once it's been submitted, this is possible. So first, you will need to reopen your application on your IFS dashboard. You will see the option to reopen as shown in the slide. The option to reopen is also visible on your application status page. And then once reopened, you can make the changes to your application. But when you have finished, please remember to submit. Just click on the green review and submit button uh, and review your application once more and then click the final submit button. So we were able to track site usage and submission uploads. So the table on the slide shows the number of applicants submitting their proposals each hour leading up to the deadline. So as you can see, the majority of applicants do leave it to the final hours. We strongly recommend you submit your application early in good time to avoid any last minute technical issues. So assessments. So uh, Innovator produced a series of five videos to take you through the assessment process. And we've selected two to include in this briefing, uh, which will explain how our assessors uh, assess your applications, 
and how applications are selected for funding. So don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for other helpful kind of hints and tips about the application process as well. <clears throat> so uh, again, with interviews, uh, if you are invited to progress to interview, um, you can bring up to nine people to attend the interview, ideally one from each organization within your consortium. You'll have a maximum of 30 minutes to prevent 30 PowerPoint slides with no videos or embedded links. And after your presentation, you'll move back to a separate breakout room where the panel will have some time to discuss your presentation. There will then be a 45 minute Q&A uh, led by the members of the panel. And then the panel will discuss your project again following the Q&A session. Um, and they potentially can invite you back for additional questioning uh, for a further 15 minutes. Um, so you will have the opportunity to respond to the assessor feedback so the panel can read it prior to your interview. Um, the response to feedback, presentation and presenters' names have to be provided ahead of the interview. Okay, so project set up for successful applicants. Uh, notification. So if you are an access, unsuccessful sorry, in this competition, you can use the feedback form from the assessor to develop your idea and apply into another competition that allows previously submitted applications. And if you are successful in this competition, you will be assigned a delivery executive who will guide you through the project setup process. Um, you will have 30 days to complete the project team, project details and bank details. And then from that, you will then have 90 days to complete your project setup. Funding may be withdrawn if this is not completed within this time frame. So again, project setup, all communication will be through IFS. Uh, the lead applicant must provide all of the collaboration agreements and exploitation plans. Um, any partners with a total individual cost of up to 50,000 must provide evidence uh, within SOE. Um, and any partners with individual project costs above 50,000, again, must provide uh, an IAR. That all grants are paid quarterly in a real in arrears, sorry, and are only paid following quarterly reporting and necessary audits. So additional support, uh, we do offer access to Innovate Edge. Um, so essentially what they can do is help you kind of guide along with your application should you be successful. Um, and they've delivered 290 innovation and growth specialists embedded in regional ecosystems across the UK. All of their contact details will be at the end of this presentation. So their growth specialist. Scale-up directors work with the company's leadership to hone its commercial strategy and help it take targeted action. For example, build investment readiness, manage innovation effectively, enter global markets and providing local to national, local to national to international growth and scaling support. There we go. So at Innovate UK, we are on a mission to embed equality, diversity and inclusion in everything that we do. We believe that great ideas can and do come from anyone and everyone, and diversity in all of its many forms do matter to us. So evidence shows that diversity and inclusion to businesses contributes enhanced innovation, satisfaction, performance, and ultimately commercial success. Uh, so we welcome and encourage applications from people of all backgrounds and are committed to making our application process accessible to everybody which is why we are developing our process and systems to ensure equitable access. And this includes providing people, uh, well, providing support, sorry, for people who have a disability or a long-term condition and face barriers when applying to us. So if you do have a disability or a long-term condition or face any barriers applying to Innovate UK and would like support, please contact our customer support team on the email address shown on the slide or on the telephone number. So please do get in touch with us as early as possible so that there's plenty of time to engage in the support available. So just to give you a quick idea as to what to expect once you reach out, we have outlined the steps on this slide. So obviously number one, contacting our customer support team as previously mentioned, please do so as early as possible. And we suggest at least 15 working days before the deadline. So together with the customer services support team uh, in your own time, which is completely up to you, you can complete a request form, which will then be sent to our partner, Diversity and Ability. 
Uh, so diversity and ability will then conduct a discovery conversation with you and make reasonable adjustments and recommendations. And as a result, they will organize and deliver bespoke reasonable adjustments for you and with you. Uh, an example of this could be a couple of hours focused on reading through questions, spell checking your work, helping with planning and time management, just to name a few. So submit your application. Once again, please make sure to give plenty of time before the deadline, especially as the deadline is set in stone in the system and no extensions can be granted under any circumstances. So as a reminder, if you would like some additional support, we suggest getting in touch with us at least 15 working days before the competition closes. Ideally, you can contact us right away so that there's plenty of time for us and diverse, uh, diversity and ability to help. Perfect. And I think that's it from me for the time being. Just moving on to Evie. Great. Yes, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Evie and I'm in the stakeholder engagement team at APC. And I'm just going to be looking after the comms for this competition. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to that. Uh, next slide, please. So the best advice I can give you is to definitely involve your marketing and communications people as soon as possible when you know that you've um, been successful in this competition. Um, so we can kind of build a team uh, between APC and your company um, to build the best communication plan and be effective with that. Because this is public funding, we do have an obligation to communicate what we're investing in and what the impacts are, such as exciting news and more. So in terms of the funding announcement, uh, one of the key documents we'll be asking you to fill out is the publication request form. So we send this to all of our winners um, and it helps with project descriptions and copywriting really. So this includes the project title, the benefits and importance of the project, quotes for press release, images uh, or logos to use in publicity, and the boilerplate text. So we kind of, like I said, we use this as a launch pad for a lot of our activities. And it's quite important because in terms of the timings um, between you knowing that you've been successful in this competition and Bayes wanting to announce um, the winners, that can be quite a short period of time. So getting this publication request form is really useful for us so we can prepare effectively um, for all the communications. So when the press release is issued by Bayes, this is uh, led by Bayes and we will amplify it from APC. It uses aggregated figures. Um, APC will also target trade and local media. Um, you're also free to do your own media, but we have to check the description of APC to make sure this is accurate. And in this press release, the information included will be to do with the lead companies involved, the technologies being developed, the money that's being invested, and the projected impacts in terms of jobs created or uh, saved and the CO2 that will be saved. So then moving on to throughout the project, we really like to encourage um, our partners to be doing their own partner led PR. Uh, we're happy to support you throughout this. So similarly to the press, any press releases, we would like to check that your description of APC is accurate. Um, we can provide a supporting quote and we can also push this through our own digital channels for you. Then we've got the government anecdotes. This is something that we submit to Bayes every month. They're just kind of small snippets that um, highlight the key project uh, successes, just information. So these are submitted so uh, in the Houses of Parliament and in Parliament, uh, Prime, Minister's, Prime Minister's questions, uh, they can use these if they are asked any questions related to this. And then lastly, we really like to do case studies. Uh, this could be any time throughout the project life cycle, um, any time there's something really exciting or something really successful that's happened. Um, so we can make these in a lot of different ways. We've done videos, we've done animations, we've done podcasts, we've done just written case studies as well. So we really like to collaborate with you to make these successful. Uh, next slide, please. So yes, again, just to reiterate, my best advice is to uh, connect us with your comms people so we can get the ball rolling with this. Uh, these are the people who you'll be in contact with. There's myself, Evie, and my colleagues, Clem and Laura. They're more on the PR side of things, um, so we'll be your main contacts. Just let us know if you have any questions, want to get in touch about anything, and hopefully I'll be in touch with some of you in the future. So yeah, that's everything. Thanks for listening.
Okay, thanks Evie, and thanks to all of our speakers today. Um, that finishes the main presentation, and we have a Q&A space on Zoom for you to add questions as they come up. Um, so please do that. We've only got a couple at the moment. Ahead of answering those questions, though, I just want to make sure that everybody knows um, that a recording of this webinar and the slide deck will be available on the APC website. So that's www.apcuk.co.uk. So um, probably tomorrow, I'd wait till tomorrow, but but as soon as you can, as soon as you want to, because I think there might have been um, a little bit of confusion regarding the start time. So unfortunately, we noticed a number of participants joining at 11.30. So for those of you that are a little bit frustrated, may have missed some of the content, it's all been recorded and the slides will be available and you can do that through the APC website. So please get in touch with us as well if you've got any more questions, but just handling the, and, and just thanking all the speakers again for the, for the content shared today. But a couple of questions that have appeared in the chat um, and please feel free if you've got any others to add to them. The first question, good question. Um, a little bit of a, a question around the percentage of funding. So the APC projects can access a maximum of 50% funding. But there is, depending on your organization size, the ability for small, medium and, and academics to get more. What that means is there has to be a balance sought there to get back to the 50%. So it could be that a larger organization only claims a, a smaller percentage, maybe 45%, 46%. But the most important thing there is you need an agreement across your consortia for all of your finances. If everybody gets 50%, that's one way of doing it. If there's a mixture of percentages, that's another way of doing it. But don't fall into the trap as others have done of agreeing a set of numbers and then going for your maximum when you get into the system, into the IFS system. So a great question, 50% is the maximum for the project. That has to be balanced across the partners, okay? So hopefully that's clear for you. Um, second question is around limits on percentages for capital. So from a capital point of view, the only way you can claim capital through these projects is within depreciation. So assets on the balance sheet and then depreciation. So they can only be depreciated during the life of the project. Um, please come and talk to us about further detailed questions. There's no limit set on that. But I think, you know, doing late stage R&D that is paying for labour and materials, there is, when it comes to the VFM, um, a challenge around putting too much capital, too much depreciation into a, into a proposal. So it's one of those that I think in discussions with the APC as you prepare your application, we'll be able to give you feedback about what you're proposing and the levels that you're expecting um, and help you find the right level to, to request in the application. I've got just another... to just to expand on that a little bit, Dan. Um, just in terms of hard and fast rules and, and regulations around percentages, we've obviously touched on the fifty percent intervention. The only other hard and fast rule is around um, research organisations. So, a research organisation can only take a maximum of thirty percent. It has to be an economic-led project to submit into a, a, a APC. So, just for information, if that wasn't covered properly earlier. Thanks, Zoe. Yeah, I think it's important to note that, that, that IFS is available for a whole range of competitions. Um, you have to read the rules around the APC to make sure you load up the right information. But talking to us and getting an agreement across your consortia before anybody starts loading up numbers is the way forward. OK, um, I've got a question from Sandra, which is talking about developing electric vehicle charges. Um, unfortunately, the APC is an on-vehicle R&D platform, so we cannot support um, projects that are infrastructure related. If, however, you are proving out charging technology by doing the interface, so working on the connection between vehicle and grid, and there is some of the work taking place on the vehicle and some off the vehicle, again, that's something that you should talk to us about, but something that's purely infrastructure related whether that's hydrogen um, or, or electric, then that's not within our scope. But we can, if you talk to us, point you in the, other, in the direction of other funders and other organizations who are working in that space 
with with government um, and private um, funding opportunities. We'll let this run a few more minutes, um, but we'll wrap up if we don't get any more questions. You've got a couple more if you go down, Dan. Okay. Thanks, Zoe. Okay. Particular obligations for winners in terms of activities. So within your application, you will include and answer questions around dissemination. So you're looking to exploit your product, you're looking to disseminate some information. So whatever you've committed to within your application, whether that shows and events um, or other ways of demonstrating your, the outcomes of the project, then you will be held to those. Um, but it's up to you about what works for you as a business. You can talk to the APC about getting support to go to these international events as well. That's something else that we do within our organization, um, working very closely with Bayes and government. I've got a question on an OEM, not from the UK. Um, the question, I'll, I'll answer it. Um, you can have overseas organizations taking part in the projects, but they must have a UK entity in order to claim grant. So it could be that you've got a letter of support. It could be um, that you've got them involved in a project, but without a legal entity, they will not be able to claim funding. So it's allowed. Um, we work in a global automotive space and, and we work with lots of companies, both within the UK, Europe and overseas. We, I think talk to us about what you're proposing, what you're thinking about. There's different ways of approaching it. So it's allowed, but they're not allowed to claim a grant. As a, um, And I think hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, just to expand on that a little bit further, it is important to come and talk to the BD team. But technically, if you are a non-funded partner, uh, but you want to put your costs associated with the project, um, then your costs will be considered. So it does then take into account the 50-50 piece, but um, it does need further explanation. So if that is your situation, just come and talk to the BD team, please. Thanks, Zoe. Um, another question that's come in about the funding. So the, the dissemination can be supported. But I guess um, maybe seeking a bit of clarification from Steph. But when we say no marketing, um, I think that's non-project related. So that's more general marketing rather than exploiting um, and disseminating the outcomes of the of the project specifically. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, thanks, Steph. Yeah, again, that's one we can explore further. It's not, um, it needs. To Anything that's applicable to the project itself is okay, but if it's business as usual marketing, then that needs to be clarified um, as non as a non eligible cost. Uh, but again, we can talk you through that um, as and when you decide to uh, submit the application or start thinking about it. So, some really good questions there, folks. But I think um, please get in touch with us. You know, there are lots of, there's a lots of detail. There's lots of elements to these large projects. There's a lot of work um, that takes place within the businesses to develop them and, and run the projects. But I think, you know, from my perspective, and I'm sure it's something that, that, that Zoe's mentioned several times as well, please get in touch with us at the APC. Um, you can do that by going on the website. All of our contact details are there. If you're really struggling, it's info at apcuk.co.uk is an email, but all of our details, mine and Zoe's and the rest of the business development team are all on the on the website. Um, so please reach out, please get in touch. And I know that we're working with a number of you already on potential applications. So we want you to be successful. Um, good luck in developing the applications and hopefully we will entertain a host of more interesting projects. But I think without seeing any more in the Q&A, We'll wrap up now, but please look back and, and the webinar, as I've said, will be available on the website along with the slides themselves. So thanks everyone. Take Bye. care, have a good day. Thank you.